Hello, my name is Michelle Hayes. Today is April 21st, 2004. Today my partner and I, Bethany Tucker, will be interviewing Arnold Langton, who was a drill sergeant in the U.S. Marines. Please state your name. Arnold Langton. When were you born? Uh, 14 July, 1934. Where were you born? Warsaw, New York. Warsaw. Where did you live before you joined the Marines? Uh, Castile, New York. You said that you attended the New York State Ranger School and then became a surveyor in the Adirondacks. What was that like? Uh, <clears throat> a lot of black flies, uh, a lot of mosquitoes, uh, wandering around, chasing, following boundary lines. Okay. Oh, pardon for being so blunt, but how did you go from forest surveyor to a marine drill instructor? Well, it took a few years to get there. I, uh, after <clears throat> spending the summer in the Adirondacks surveying, I uh, joined the Marine Corps. Why did you choose to go into the Marine Corps? Why not a different military branch? Uh, good question. I, uh, at that time, they were drafting people, and uh, I got my letter from my friends and neighbors that uh, I was about to be drafted and I didn't want to be drafted. And I went to the recruiting office in uh, Rochester and uh, there was a waiting list for the Army, Navy, and Air Force. But the Marine Corps said, you could go anytime you want. So I picked my date, 28th of September, 1953. Where were you stationed originally? Uh, <clears throat> I spent 18 months in uh, Camp Lejeune, then I spent uh, another, oh, just, just about 18 months, uh, half of it was spent in Japan and the other half was spent in Okinawa, and then I came back to the States, I uh, became an instructor at Platoon Leadership School in Quantico, Virginia. And then I went down to Paris Island. Where's Paris Island? Uh, South Carolina. I will be there tomorrow morning. Mm -hmm. There's a drill instructor reunion taking place uh, starting tomorrow and I'm going to attend my first one. Mm -hmm. So what did you do at the artillery and drill instructor school? What were you trained to do? I was a surveyor in artillery and uh, you need surveying in artillery so that you know where the guns are and you know where the target is and they uh, can fire a, a projectile you know, 10 or 15 miles and you need to know precisely where your gun is and where the target is in order to hit it. So what training was involved to become a drill instructor? Uh, <clears throat> I kind of forgot actually. Uh, the, obviously we had to know all the <clears throat> various types of drill, uh, spent a lot of time uh, uh, drilling fellow and students, fellow students in the school and uh, being critiqued on our drill procedures and uh, <clears throat> there was a little bit of psychology uh, taught about the <clears throat> mental exchange in going from a civilian into a, a recruit and you take advantage of that uh, shock treatment uh, to train your recruits. Did you feel that the instructor schools prepared you for your duties? Sure, sure. So at what point, what was going on at that point during the Cold War? Well, when I joined, I joined the Marine Corps about uh, a month after the Korean War was over. And uh, during my five years in the Marine Corps, there was very little military conflict. Uh, about two weeks before I got out of the Marine Corps, uh, I almost got uh, extended to go over to Beirut, where they, uh, <clears throat> there was a military uh, operation in Beirut, where they took a, uh, uh, some Marines, went over there and put down uh, <clears throat> some type of insurrection. I kind of forgot the details, but it was a constant Middle East 
turmoil over there. Which country was Beirut in? Or? Oh, Lebanon. Lebanon. Lebanon? Yeah, over in Lebanon. So, so how did you feel about that, that you could have been sent over there? Well, I, uh, <clears throat> it was kind of scary because uh, I only had about two or three weeks left before I was getting out of the Marine Corps. And <clears throat> a call came down for a artillery surveyor and there was only three of us at Paris Island, and one of which ironically turned out to be my junior drill instructor, uh, whom I took home, helped him pack, and, and in a day's time he was gone to Camp Lejeune, and the next day he was over in, in uh, Lebanon. So what was your daily schedule like as a drill instructor? Uh, the recruits go from five o'clock in the morning to ten o'clock at night when the drill instructor has to go from about four fifteen in the morning to about eleven thirty at night and uh, that's kind of a long day. What and, could you do in the course of that day? Uh, you were with the recruits constantly. Uh, you wake them up, uh, take them to breakfast, take them to training, uh, do training on your own. Uh, <clears throat> There's always a variety of types of discipline actions that have to take place with recruits. Uh, Such as? Well, uh, one of the typical things is that uh, after about three weeks uh, in a recruit training, uh, some of the recruits don't like it. And they try to come up with excuses to get out of it. And one of the typical excuses is, I'm nervous. And uh, so we play little mind games with them and get them back into shape, and, and generally they go go on their way. But we lose about uh, oh, 10 to 15 percent of the recruits out of the 12-week period that don't make it for one one reason or another. And let me give you an example. Uh, at mail call one time, <coughs> uh, a recruit come up. And I was handing out mail, and uh, uh, <clears throat> oh, about 10 feet away from me, he said, oh, I said, what's the matter? He says, I broke my leg. I said, what do you mean you broke your leg? He said, I broke my leg. And he broke his, uh, the small bone in the lower part of his leg, which I think is the, the tibia, fibia, tibia, I guess it is. And uh, <clears throat> he had a problem of constantly breaking bones. His bones were, were very weak and sent him to the, <coughs> to the medical dispensary and, and he was uh, discharged, given a medical discharge. Uh, I had another recruit that only had one kidney. He was born that way. And uh, they gave him a medical discharge. And a lot of times recruits just can't take the military environment and they're processed out. They're given a general discharge. You're not given a medical discharge, but a general discharge. Well, um, what, what exactly did the general discharge prove? Did that just prove you couldn't serve in the Marines and you could go serve somewhere else? Or no, you just, you're... You're just incapable of... Yeah, you're uh, incapable of military service. So what were your duties as an artillery instructor? Uh, <clears throat> When uh, officers came out of platoon leadership school at Quantico, they were then sent to other schools uh, to train in their major occupation. And, uh, and the artillery school was at uh, Quantico. And I taught artillery surveying to, uh, <coughs> to brand new, new tenants, and, uh, which was kind of an interesting experience because uh, Surveying requires a little bit of knowledge of geometry and math, but uh, when uh, uh, a lieutenant chooses his uh, profession in the military, uh, he could be a history major or a psychology major in college or uh, English major and have very little math skills. And so it was kind of difficult working with some of these officers and trying to train them and give them the basics of, of surveying. 
type of drills were involved? Just dealing with certain weapons and firing them to well, see what their range <clears throat> were? That, that, that's a good question. A very interesting thing happened. And Quantico is a relatively small base. And uh, so once the the officers were fairly familiar with all aspects of artillery. They'd go out and they'd fire, uh, I think it was a uh, 155, uh, <coughs> well, millimeter, 155 uh, artillery piece. Uh, it's not millimeters, I don't know. But in any event, uh, being a small range, uh, there's various charges that you use for the, for the projectile and they go from charge two to charge seven. Charge seven will go 15 miles, charge two probably a couple miles. And uh, and these are powder bags that they put in the canisters to fire out the projectile. And one day as we were <coughs> having these lieutenants fire the guns, we heard an exceptionally loud explosion. And we knew that somebody forgot to take out five powder bags out of the canister. So it was a charge seven and not a charge two. And uh, everybody at the fire control center immediately knew what happened. And the officer in charge tasked me to go out and find the hole in the ground. And we plotted it on the map and it was US Route 1 going through Quantico. So we went out in the Jeep and, and found the hole and it was about 200 yards from US 1. So did you just fire projectile bags, or did you actually use machine, like machinery and weapons that would be normally oh. used in combat? Oh yeah, they're, they're, they're actual weapons. The projectile would go out and make a big hole in the ground. And in this particular case, the big hole in the ground was near US-1. Mm -hmm. Apparently no one ever <coughs> noticed the explosion as they were driving down through it. But uh, we had to fill out a safety report and go through all the problems associated with that. So when did you go to Mount Fuji in Okinawa? Uh, I went over in the, uh, when did I go? In this summer of 1954, I, I went to Japan and uh, went to Camp McNair and uh, being a surveyor was aware of the fact that I was living on the thousand meter line thousand uh, meter uh, contour line on the side of Mount Fuji. And Mount Fuji is nothing but uh, on the sides of it a lot of volcanic ash. And, uh, so the, the camp was there and uh, we had an artillery range outside of the camp. And that was in 1954, which is only nine years after the uh, Second World War. And there was still quite a bit of hostility in Japan concerning American occupation of Japan. And, uh, and uh, the regiment would go out uh, periodically and, and fire weapons, uh, actual live weapons, uh, into the uh, impact area. And periodically the Army would come up and uh, fire a missile. I forgot the type of missile that they had, but they had a uh, missile that they would go up and fire, and again, every time they fired the missile, there was a lot of protest by the Japanese about firing missiles in Japan. And uh, <coughs> uh, so I lived there on the side of Mount Fuji, which, by the way, if it wasn't for the terrain and the soil, but the vegetation vegetation types are just like around here. Uh, they've got maples and yellow birches and various types of uh, uh, spruce trees. So it looks just like upstate New York. And in fact, the weather was a lot like upstate New York in the, in the wintertime. We were living in tents there. And in the wintertime, uh, when it snowed, uh, somebody in the tent had to get up and rake the snow off the tent so the tent wouldn't collapse. But uh, in, in we had uh, below zero weather. And sleeping in tents was kind of a interesting experience. So that was the type of field work you did? You basically did the same as you did? We, we uh, right, uh, we, uh, in, every time the guns 
go out to fire, they have to be located, and, and the survey team would locate those uh, those guns. And then periodically, we'd also locate uh, new targets in the impact area. Uh, and we did that with various types of surveying techniques. Uh, one time, we practiced uh, very fast moving artillery operation and used a helicopter and and went from uh, mountain to mountain or ridge to ridge uh, doing triangulation and extending control rapidly uh, in a fast moving moving force across Japan. And we used a pretty large area in that area of Japan to uh, practice that type of survey. Did your formal education in forestry make you better qualified for the job than others? Well, and specifically in Mount Fuji? Other than being able to identify all the forest types <laughs> and, and being able to survey, uh, the range, New York State Ranger School has a, uh, a kind of a major in curriculum and still does today. Uh, and they're associated with uh, SUNY College and it's a second year program up there for people that want to get involved in, in surveying and free forestry. So how are the officers that you encountered in the service? Uh, I thought uh, very good. I never had uh, any, any problem. They were all professional. Uh, they knew their job. And uh, uh, they worked well with the enlisted folks. So who was your first sergeant? You mentioned him in uh the paperwork we oh, I did. My, my first first sergeant was James A. Dean. <laughs> Jimmy Dean? James A. Dean, yeah. He was a very large man, very, very powerful, and uh, ran a tight ship. Ran a tight ship. So what exactly did he do with, when you were working together? Well, I didn't work with him. He, he uh, <clears throat> the first sergeant is kind of in charge of, uh, he's kind of the operations person for a given organization and uh, uh, took care of all the disciplinary actions. And, and, uh, he was just a very uh, authoritarian individual and had the bulk to prove it. <laughs> so who was your gunny sergeant? My gunnery sergeant, uh, John B. Doherty. That was a very interesting time at uh, Camp Lejeune. And Michelle, you'll appreciate this. Uh, John Doherty was born a Catholic in uh, Boston, uh, married a Jewish girl, and became an atheist. John Doherty uh, read a book a day. I may be exaggerating, but he was constantly reading. Uh, he was a very well-informed individual. Uh, also, in our uh, little artillery section, we had a person that dropped out of uh, theology school. <clears throat> he had uh, about three or four years uh, in studying for a priest. I had another person in the same section that went into study for a priest for only one year. And they joined the military. And they both joined the military. And the theological arguments that went on between John Doherty, who was an avowed atheist, understood and knew the Catholic religion, and because his wife, and she was a very devout Jewish girl, uh, <clears throat> from his wife, uh, developed a good understanding of the Jewish religion, and, and he had two people in his section, and he was in charge of the section, uh, that were very knowledgeable about Catholic theology. <clears throat> the, the, the arguments and debates went on. It was, <laughs> it was a very interesting experience. So a gunny sergeant is just a short term for a gunnery sergeant? Uh, <clears throat> or artillery? Sergeant. No, it, it, it's a term applied to a tech sergeant, which is an E8, E8, and uh, 
and it's primarily used as a senior sergeant in artillery or a senior sergeant in, uh, in armory, or kind of referred to as gunnery sergeants. So what does E8 stand for? There are uh, nine levels of enlisted uh, ranks in the military. E1 is your basic private, and this is true for all services, Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines. And E9 is your master sergeant. And, and E9 is a master sergeant in, in the Marine Corps, uh, Air Force, and uh, Army, but they're chiefs in the Navy. And they have any service has different names for the for the ranks in between between E1 and E9. And officers go the same way, they O1 up to O7, I think it is. So how often did you work with James Dean and John Doherty? Well, every day with John Doherty, and of course every time he went back to the barracks, James A. Dean was there to make sure that the barracks were in good shape. How did they make your experience more memorable despite the theological wars? And <laughs> That's a good way to express it, theological wars. Uh, James, Sergeant Dean was just an impressive individual and, and uh, just made a good impact on anybody. I mean, he, was, he was a very pleasant person, uh, uh, but you know, just no fooling around with him. When he said something, he meant it. John Doherty, on the other hand, uh, was a good old Boston uh, Irishman and, and uh, typically expressed himself and acted like a typical <laughs> Irish Bostonian. <laughs> Liked his beard and, and very vocal. Normally, you only need four years of service in the military branch. Why did you choose to stay for five? I, when I joined, it was three years, and then I re-enlisted for two. And that's how I got into five years. And uh, then when I went to Quantico, uh, and, <coughs> and was an instructor uh, training college graduates that had graduated from high school the same year that I did. And at that point in my life, I thought that you had to really be smart to go to college. But I found out that some of those college graduates weren't too smart. And so at that point in time, I decided to, to go to college. Unfortunately, I ended up going to Paris Island. Uh, <coughs> it was not unfortunate. I enjoyed that. Uh, <coughs> but, uh, when I got down to Paris Island, I, I started to actively uh, pursue you know, getting into college, which I ultimately did. I left Paris Island one day, uh, handling the recruits. Five days later, I was living in a dorm with recruits. <laughs> so what made being a drill instructor so inspiring that you would choose to do that instead of another career? In well, the I had no choice. I had no choice. Uh, I was assigned to Paris Island, and uh, one thing about drill instructor school, if you fail drill instructor school, you will not be promoted, uh, because if you fail school, then you're not qualified to be an NCO, not a commissioned officer. Uh, so, and it's good motivation to make sure that uh, everybody goes through it. it, it and the first day of drill instructor school was a rather interesting experience. Uh, in the barracks, uh, there were sergeants, staff sergeants, tech sergeants, and master sergeants. And we had uh, probably five or six master sergeants going through drill instructor school. And these are individuals that had, you know, 15, 20 years experience in the Marine Corps. So we went first day of classes, and then we came back. Uh, for lunch and walked into the barracks and all of our bunks were tore up. Stuff thrown out of our lockers. That's the typical way to train a recruit. Some of the senior master sergeants didn't appreciate that. And uh, several of them went up and left school. And I'm not sure what happened to their careers, but they left. Uh, 
because in drill instructor school, they treat you as a recruit, even though you're a senior NCO. And it takes a little bit getting used to. But uh, <coughs> you learn that that's the way to treat somebody in order to get them through recruit training. There are drill instructors, some drill instructors, that, that fail in, uh, in handling a platoon. If you don't do a good job and you lose discipline in the platoon, you've lost the platoon. So then do you go back to school or are you demoted? You're, you're, you're removed from your duties. But then what do they do? Uh, I'm not sure what happens to them once they're removed from their duties, but uh, <clears throat> uh, you've got to maintain discipline in the platoon. If you don't maintain discipline, uh, you fail at your job. Did you ever experience problems in your platoon? Uh, no. Now they're pretty good? Well, yeah. I survived. You really survived. <laughs> what, about, what about the recruits? <laughs> uh, well, I, a lot of recruits left, uh, as, I, as I said, 10 or 15 percent uh, uh, don't make it through recruit training for, for one reason or another. Um, I had several recruits uh, attempt suicide. Were they okay? After no, no, no. They, they were they were processed out. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can you remember any other experience about working with the recruits? Uh, yes. Uh, since I'm going to a drill instructor's reunion, the first reunion I've ever gone gone to, uh, they have a DI storytelling contest, and so I wrote up a couple of stories. I'll give you one. This is, this is kind of interesting. Uh, for mail call, uh, and when I was, at that time, in, uh, you didn't have your social security number. You gave, the service gave you a separate number. Uh, they called it the service number. Now it's your uh, social security number. So in order to try to uh, get the recruits to remember their service number, I would call out on a mail call, I would just call the service number, I wouldn't call the name. So as I'm <clears throat> calling off these numbers and just casually throwing out the letters, I noticed that the name didn't match to the recruit to pick up the letter. So then of course it was a couple of days later, we got another letter and it happened again and I said, hey, you know, wait a minute, I gotta check this thing out. So the third time it happened, I said, I paid attention to it, and I said, how come this name isn't the same name <clears throat> that you've got? And he says, oh, it's my girlfriend, and she's playing a joke on me. I said, okay. So uh, I gave him the letter, but I was still a little curious on this. So I went down to the uh, Italian office, and uh, and explained the situation to one of the clerks down there. And the clerk says, well, let me check into this thing. So they started checking into it. The individual was an escaped convict. He joined the Marine Corps to hide from the, <laughs> from the authorities. Unfortunately, his fingerprints <laughs> uh, <clears throat> got him. But that was his real name. He changed the name when he joined the service. So we joined under a false name, and uh, I got caught. So did he just go back to jail, or? Oh, he, he went back to jail. Or? Yes, he did. Yes, so he did. they didn't make <laughs> him to do a service for payment of that. Uh, no, no. Anything else? No, I had another situation. I, I can write this one up. Uh, after about three or four weeks, uh, the recruits come up and say that they're nervous, and so this recruit came up and said. Um, I don't want to complete recruit training. He said, why not? He says, well, I've already been in the Marine Corps. I said, well, if you've been in the Marine Corps, you don't have to go to recruit training. Why are you down here for recruit training? He says, oh, I was a corpsman. Now, the Marines don't have their own medical service. The Navy provides the medical service to the Marine Corps. So assigned to the Marine Corps are corpsmen, Navy corpsmen. And and if the corpsman is a sergeant, then he stays with the sergeants and, you know, in the same type of quarters. And uh, 
So I said, you mean to tell me you spent four years with the Marine Corps and heard all the stories about recruit training and didn't believe him? He says, that's right. <laughs> I said, sorry, you got to go through recruit training. And he did. So was the recruit training really as bad as everyone made it out to be? Or were they thankful for it later? Oh, you're always thankful for it, but it's it's tough. I mean, uh, they, I mean, 5 o'clock in the morning to 10 o'clock at night, you're constantly going. And recruits wake up precisely at 5 o'clock because somebody goes in and turns the lights on. And when they lay down at night, at 10 o'clock, they're sound asleep in, in a couple of minutes. Uh, you're just constantly moving. Uh, one of the most gratifying aspects of being a drill instructor is at graduation because the parents come down to see their sons graduate. And in many cases, they don't recognize them. Number one, they got a haircut, which is different than <laughs> what they had before, generally. Uh, down in South Carolina, there's uh, a lot of sun, so they're far more tan than when, when they were when they first came down. And even though it's a 12-week period, uh, there are recruits that lose lots of weight and recruits that gain a lot of weight. And they're disciplined. <laughs> they aren't slouched over or anything. They're standing up straight and they're clean and, and uh, well-behaved. And it's a shock to a lot of parents to, to see their son transformed in 12 weeks from a high school student into a full-fledged Marine. So how was your graduation like? My graduation at yeah. uh, Paris Island, I really don't remember. I, I, we obviously graduated. My, my mother didn't come down. Uh, in fact, I'm not sure there was any, there may have been some parents there. I, I'm not sure. So, Gary, anything else to share anything else? Any more stories? The recruits? Oh, got lots more, of stories. More stories about the recruits? <laughs> Go on and on. <laughs> Let me tell you another story. My wife and I took a cruise up in, uh, off the coast of Alaska and on a cruise ship, uh, uh, they put six or seven or three or four couples together at a table. And at this table, there were four women, myself, my wife, uh, myself, and another individual. And. Uh, so I tried to get this individual in the, in the conversation on daily topics and stuff. And during the process, I mentioned the fact that while I was stationed at uh, Camp Lejeune, and when I went from Camp Lejeune over to Japan and back again, uh, that total time uh, added up to 96 days aboard ship and during my five years in the Marine Corps. And I mentioned the fact that I was on board ship. And he said, uh, what service were you? in the Marine Corps. He had retired after 27 years in the Marine Corps, had held every rank from private all the way up through the enlisted ranks, the warrant officer ranks, uh, and retired as a major. And that's the only thing you talk about from then on was about the Marines. <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, yeah I did all kinds of stories on, uh, on Paris Island. Go on and on and on. Okay, you want to hear another one? Uh, let's see. Uh, oh, another one I, I wrote up in there. Uh, recruits serve drill instructors in the uh, in the mess hall, and uh, I was sitting there with a couple other drill instructors, and <laughs> you know, a recruit come in with a plate of spaghetti. He was carrying a plate around, but the spaghetti was hanging off the side of the plate, and the drill instructor said. Private, don't put that spaghetti down, you're going to get it dirty. And the private says, yes, sir. Goes around <laughs> flipping the spaghetti up out of the plate, <laughs> which cracked everybody up there. <laughs> uh, oh, boy. Uh, I don't know. I, I have to think. <laughs> I have to take some notes as I'm going down to Paris Island so I can uh, come up with some of these stories. Uh, and of course every drone instructor's got them down there. I mean, uh, you can't go by a, a day without having a story. I guess another thing that I ought to 
point okay. out is that when you're drilling troops day in and day out for two years, uh, the process of drilling becomes a normal uh, non-thought process reaction. And uh, one day I was out drilling the troops on the parade field and another drill instructor and I were carrying on a conversation. And uh, <clears throat> in our mind, we knew when every foot, left foot or right foot hit the ground and, and we could carry on a conversation and call out a command and it would be on the right foot. And uh, uh, it's just, uh, uh, just like breathing. Becomes a, a process, and, and if you've ever watched somebody that's not that uh, <clears throat> experienced in drilling troops, they have to walk in step with the the, the platoon or the group that they're they're marching, and uh, uh, and it's just a, a big difference. Uh, another little story about marching: uh, we had a new commander down at Paris Island and he decided that every recruit had to attend religious services on Sunday. <clears throat> so they got the whole, all the recruits down on their parade field and divided them up into different religious organizations. Well, I took the Catholic troops. <laughs> and, and so I got, we had them in columns of four and I got four uh, platoon leaders, <coughs> recruits, the senior recruits, and put them up front and said, here's where you go. You, know, you walk down here and you go, because there's no way I was able to, to drill or control it because there was you know, six, seven hundred recruits, whatever it was, I don't know. Even so we got them together, kind of left the parade field, and we're walking down the, the main street there at Paris Island to go down, uh, and the Catholic services was held at the uh, the outdoor movie theater that they had there. But I'm calling cadence. Right? One, two, three, four, left, right, left, right. And I'm looking down this big long line of recruits and they're all in step, but there's a difference in the travel of the sound between where I am to the ones in the front. And you can see that sound wave in the recruits as they're walking down. <laughs> yeah. So, in retrospect, do you feel that it was all worthwhile spending five years in the service? Oh, absolutely. absolutely. I, I uh, yeah. And the two years at Paris Island, I would never do again. Never? Never. never. I mean, it, the workload, I mean, the tension in the workload is incredible. But once you've gone through it, the experience was uh, very valuable because I got an opportunity to see uh, all kinds of people. And uh, one statistics that I kept to illustrate the, uh, the normal curve of distribution of people that we have is the fact that I taught seven recruits on how to tie their shoes. There were seven recruits that did not know how to tie their shoes. Just to tie them in general? Right. Not, there wasn't they didn't know how to handle the knots. I don't know how many recruits that didn't know how to shave. I don't know how many recruits it was that did not brush their teeth to take care of their <clears throat> normal hygiene. I mean, it's a lot, and uh, and and in your normal day life, you cannot associate with everybody in Rome, New York. I mean, you just can't do it. But there are people in Rome, New York, that don't know how to brush their teeth, that don't know how to comb their hair, do not know how to take care of personal hygiene. I'll guarantee you. I mean, you can find them if you look around. If you if you're conscious of it, if you walk around to the WalMarts or whatever, you'll see them every once in a while. <clears throat> uh, but that experience down there, because uh, we had everybody. Uh, I had a recruit that I could put my hand around his leg. I had a recruit that was incredibly overweight. Uh, we had some people come down to Paris Island to. Uh, try to sell the Marine Corps on exercise equipment. And this exercise equipment consisted of two handles and some rubber bands that you could use for uh, 
uh, <clears throat> for exercising your muscles. And I said, I got a private that can't pull one band. The guy says, no, you don't. I said, yes, I do. And I took him up and we got the private. And the private was so weak that he could not handle one little, these little bands. Of it. Uh, now, on the other hand, I had uh, privates that, you know, spent half their day in, in the weight room and were incredibly strong. Uh, so you get the whole spectrum of people, uh, physically, mentally, uh, they're all there and you get to see those. And that's, you know, that's, unless you're dealing with that type of uh, situation in the public, you never get to see the total distribution of people. But down there, you do. And because you got that distribution, there's all kinds of stories about weak guys, strong guys, dumb guys, smart guys. I had recruits that had doctorate degrees. Are you given like hygiene kits or like, oh, yes. toothbrushes? Well, or? yeah, they're, they're, <laughs> <laughs> yes, they get all the basic things to take care of. And, you know, folding, excuse me. Hello? Sorry about that. That's okay. I'm not, but I... <laughs> <laughs> so everything was, it was pretty much all worthwhile in the long run? Oh, sure. Sure. Yep. Uh, yeah, I'm a little disappointed it took five years, but I don't know how else to do it. Uh, but I enjoyed, I enjoyed, uh, uh, obviously I enjoyed the opportunity of going to Japan, living over there for six or seven months, whatever it was, and enjoyed the opportunity of going down to Okinawa. I uh, had the opportunity to go to Hong Kong. Uh, it took, uh, I don't know, 20 some odd days to sail from San Diego to Japan and, and another 20 days to coming back. Uh, but they were all, it was, those were long, boring days, but, you know, it was interesting. And, uh, <clears throat> no, I enjoyed, uh, enjoyed the five years. Awesome. Oh, yeah. Okay, then. Thank you very much. Okay.